You've taken a wrong turn down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, I'm Maureen Bogey. And I'm Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to the Creep Street Podcast. That's right. That is correct. Ah, thank you so much for joining us today. First day of 2021. First day, of th- that's right. It's not, you know, when we're recording this, it's not yet 2021, but right, it's a I few forgot. days before. But it's going to be, when you hear this, it will be New Year's Day. Happy New Year. Oh my gosh. How exciting is it that 2021 is here? I'm excited. Oh my God. Wow. I am very excited. This feels good. Hopefully, you know what, we're, we're going to try to bring in positivity as much as we can. Absolutely. This, this advice is coming to you from someone who really knows what they're talking about and doesn't spend most of her evenings um, eating while watching Dawson's Creek. Oh. That's uh, what I'm trying to say is that's me. And that's me. Oh, Anywho, yeah, nothing wrong with a little bit of the creek. A little bit of that creek. If you would like to support us, please follow us on Instagram at Creep Street Podcast, Twitter at Creep Street Pod. We're on Facebook. Uh, please let your friends know about us. Tell your, your friggin' roommate or something. That's five right. stars. It, it really means a lot to us. We also have a Patreon That's if right. you are interested in contributing to that. And speaking of the Patreon, Dylan, will you please list off the names of the most elite That's who are right. our top-tier Patreon donors? We're kicking off 2021 with the best of the best. Of course, the dream, James Watkins. The finished face, Via Alonfist. The madman, Marcus Hall. The vivacious, Vicky McHugh. The tenacious, Teresa Hackworth. The heartbreak kid, Chris Hackworth. The oh-so-suave, Sean Richardson. The British bonebreaker, Bex Martin. The notorious, Nicholas Barker. The terrifying, Taylor Lashmet. And the Count of Cool, Cameron Corliss. Thank you so much to our top tier donors. That's right. And if you are interested in joining them, feel free to check out www.patreon.com. Dot com, give it a slash, and then give it a Creep Street podcast. That's right. Give it an enter or and, a return, depending on your keyboard. And on our Facebook page, if you look, there's an attachment. There is another page. It's a little uh, oh, yes. group called Citizens of the Milky Way. It's a little fan page where we interact daily with with fans. We post articles we like, stuff yeah. we're going to be doing in the future. Anyone can join that. You just click join, and then one of us will let you in. But uh, I haven't talked about that in a while, but it's still growing. So, and it's so I fun. wanted to make sure people know that as we're getting new listeners and stuff that they uh, know they can come hang out. We're sharing some fun memes. You know, we're having some laughs. We're talking about some weird stuff. It's fun. That's right. Now, Dylan, speaking of weird stuff, what is the weird stuff that you are bringing to the table today? Today, we are talking about the Zimbabwe encounter. Yes. This is a UFO story. We haven't done a UFO story. In a while. And you know what? That is that is a resolution we are making for 2021 is to bring more alien content. I think the last one we did was Rendlesham. Was yeah. that the last one? That was 20 episodes ago. That was, that was like episode 30 or something. Yeah. So you know what? We're starting the new year off in earnest with our resolutions and we are giving you some alien content. content. Ah. Absolutely. Let me just start by citing my sources. Yeah. Uh, my first is an article called Remembering Zimbabwe. Boy's Great Alien Invasion by Sean Christie at the Mail and Guardian. The Aerial School Aliens page on fandom.com. The Mysterious Mass Alien Encounter of Zimbabwe by Brent Swanser at Mysterious Universe. And of course, uh, the recent uh, documentary, The Phenomenon by James Fox, where they talk about this story. So, yeah, it's such a cool documentary. In the documentary, they talk about this near the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think there's also, they said there's another documentary coming out that's space just that focuses solely on on this oh. happening that happened at this school oh, in amazing. Zimbabwe. Okay, I can't wait for that. That'll be awesome. So let's begin our story. It all starts on September 16th, 1994. Wow. It's a beautiful but kind of a hot day in the rural farming community of Rua, located in Zimbabwe, about 20 miles outside of the country's capital. And it's in this town you'll find a tiny private elementary school tucked away in the countryside called the Aerial School, which teaches children from ages 5 to 12. And it was on a Friday, this September 16th, at about 10.15 a.m. when the event started. 
The children were outside playing for their mid-morning break out in the field that was next to the school. Now, some reports would say that it was actually pretty toasty that day. It was only 10, 15 a.m., and by then it was already up to what would be equivalent to 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my so, God, yeah. So already, you know, 10, 15 a.m., it's already getting hot. Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit early to be getting that hot. That's just my opinion. Yeah, at least we're, I don't want to ruffle any right. feathers. At least but. we're, the part of the, you know, some parts in the U.S. get that hot, obviously, but, you know, where we're mm. from, we're used to it being nice and cool. Yeah, you know come saying? on now. Suddenly, some of the children stopped in their tracks when they saw what appeared to be three or four silver balls flying through the sky above the school. Within moments, these strange orbs had caught the attention of all the kids these silver balls would sometimes flash red before vanishing in a burst of light and then appearing again in a different part of the sky. Okay, so this you, this is familiar to Skinwalker Ranch uh, and Rendlesham. And a little bit of that sphere. Yes. These silver balls. Yeah. Wow, okay. One witness was quoted saying, This thing, whatever it was, was beautiful. It had a circular shaped bright light as the leader and behind it were tails of light and beautiful colors, green, orange, and yellow. It moved slowly and looked as if it was just above the house. The amazing thing is that it moved absolutely silently. Now, it was then that these objects began to descend from the sky and approach the ground. Weird. Witnesses say it seemed to be following along a line of transmission towers but that can't be confirmed. That was just what some people said. It just appeared to be doing. Oh, okay, okay. One of these objects in particular seemed to be dropping down lower than the rest and by now was hovering right above the ground over a cluster of gum trees about 300 feet from where the kids were playing. Oh my gosh, gum trees? I know that's not the part that I'm supposed to be excited by, but I know. But I'm excited by the gum trees as well. Now, this particular field where the craft was hovering was actually off limits to the children. There was dangerous thorn bushes and wildlife in there, and so the kids were, you know, they weren't allowed right. to go. Right. Now, my sources here are divided. Some say that this forbidden area was fenced off from the school, mm -hmm. and others say it wasn't. Either way, which I thought was kind of darling, yeah. it seems that whether there was a fence or not, the children only ventured as far as they were allowed to go. Oh. Sounds like they stopped right at the brush. Is from what I say, whether there was a fence there or not, it sounds like they stopped they knew at the, the brush. Rules. They yeah. knew the rules. Good oh, for them. That's Good so kids. Nice. But from where they were, the craft was probably about a hundred yards away. Now this is when things got really crazy. Okay, they're about to. They're get crazy. about to get crazy. Okay, because I'm already, you know, things are let's already talk seeming about crazy. This. I know this is just the beginning of the story of this, so right. it's easy to kind of just move past because of you know you're, you you right. want to get to the meat of it. Think of it, right? But still, if this is where the story ended, it would still be interesting. And for the record, there was about 110 people there all together between students, teachers faculty. Yeah. It was 62 witnesses total, all of them children. So all the children are outside. I, isn't that so funny that it's no none of the adults saw it at the time? Well, we're going to get or, to okay, that. Okay. We will get to that. Okay. Sorry, I'm jumping the gun here like we a freaking loser. We will get loser. to that. Now, from the top of the craft, something began to emerge. It was a small humanoid figure, <gasps> approximately three feet tall, they're always small, these fuckers. And it was robed in black. Now, this black suit it wore was described as being tight-fitting and shiny. Okay, yeah. So, fucker likes tight leather. Yeah, wow. Okay, so he's either... No, there's a few options. So he's either like a leather daddy, or he is someone that um, is like in a, a tight space suit. Right. Um, and it's for you, his utility, or he's like high couture right. fashion. I think this was just the Ramones. Okay, got it. The creature had a scrawny neck and narrow face. Its arms and legs were likewise very thin. One witness described their eyes as being as big as rugby balls. Oh, God. Here's something that I thought was weird. It also described the aliens as having long black hair. 
That's like, so like long weird. flowing. The only other time I've heard of that is David, David Huggins. I, I was just going to say that is David Huggins when he was talking about Crescent. Crescent had like a bob cut. Yeah, she had like bangs almost like in the way he's depicted. Yeah, yeah like the, a share. We always long. made the joke. Yeah. But this one, would, yeah, these, they had like long flowing black hair. It's like weird. You know, we think of aliens, we think of them as, you know, just little bald fuckers. But, you know, yeah. not that that's what they have to look like but just this like a mane of just dark of hair. just a, you know luxurious huh. dark hair like what why okay the entity seemed unconcerned by the crowd of children and it made its way toward them okay confidence confidence is key just then a second being began to emerge from the top of the craft the kids especially the younger ones began to scream in terror calling out for help they were actually afraid that what these things were were Tokoloshi. Oh, really? They thought these were the little Tokoloshi, which we covered. Or Zimbabwe is actually in Southern Africa. It's right above South Africa, kind of to the northeast of it. Uh, it shares like a northeastern border with South Africa. It's kind okay. of there between Botswana and Mozambique. Wow. Well. So that's so it makes that's so funny that the kids were thinking it was Tokoloshi. I wow. know. Isn't that wild? Okay. I, I mean, thought that was a sense, great. Though. What a great throwback, right? Totally. And I bet that's, I mean, kind of what they're described as. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Kind of, yeah. So large swaths of these younger kids, they run screaming back inside of the school, of Mm -hmm. course. Now, some obviously lingered captivated by what they were seeing. Oh, yeah. In one of the sources, it described that the first being, when it seemed to notice the children, and some of them that seemed they noticed them right away and some it didn't. In one source, it said when the first being noticed the children, it vanished suddenly, almost like it got scared, and then it reappeared, or at least something that looked like it, reappeared behind the craft. And it says two of the beings stood there and just silently watched the children from the craft. Like they didn't want to get close. Okay, so they like these beings might have the ability to kind of like apparate. Like yeah, if to like, take a Harry Potter term, either they traveled very fast or they were somehow able to port, you know, through space right. time. And here, one witness named Emily Trim describes her experience. All I can tell you is that two beings were hopping alongside Lisa and I. They were curious. They weren't touching the ground. They were almost like mimicking us. All of a sudden, they were in front of us. I described them as being about arm's reach, and we were frozen. Telepathic images started going across my face, communicating through my eyes. That's all I can really describe it as. It was just image after image after image. Those thoughts came from the man's eyes. One of the other girls standing beside me, she got communication about the environment, and for me, Mine was more technology uses and uses of technology. Wow, so they're just kind of getting this information right. through the, but okay, so, oh, wow. Sort of these telepathic images, wow. yes. Now, so all those younger kids that ran back to the school, they ran inside to find it nearly vacant because all the teachers were attending a faculty meeting. Where is, wh- there needs get to, to be an adult. The only adult they could find was the mother of one of the students. She was working at the school's concession stand where they sold stuff like candy and soda. Oh my God. Unfortunately, she refused to come along with the children because she believed it was a ruse to get her away from the candy stand (laughs) so they could raid it for treats. (laughs) This is like the most Steven Spielberg situation I've ever heard in my life. Oh yeah. Now, usually on the show, we're always, we always argue, you know, believe the children. Oh yeah. And we do, obviously. However, this particular instance, I kind of, oh my God, I kind of can so understand funny. a little bit because why she might not have left her post. It would have been one thing if the children had come in saying, "Oh, one of the kids is hurt," or, right, or right. "There's a stranger on the schoolyard," or, or even, you know, "There's a wild animal on the schoolyard." Right, but they're coming saying there's. Right, or there's a spacecraft or something, right? So at the same time, you know, regardless if there's a spacecraft or not, you could understand why she might think, oh, especially if maybe if the kids are cheeky that way, if they've before tried to be like, oh, come, you know. Right, right, right. You know, and that she just knows, you know, oh, they're just having some fun. Oh, because they just want to get candy, which, I mean, they do. You would also think if these children were trying to trick it, you'd be able to read the body language. Right. Yeah, I, I would I could say be dead wrong. Though. I think really the the issue here was that there needed to be more adult supervision. Oh yeah, there. like it shouldn't have been up to just this one woman whose job was to you know right. be in charge of the candy. Also, and who knows, maybe she was 
afraid that if she let, you know, the school, she'd, the tr- she'd get in trouble with the school or something. Right, right, you know? yeah. Well, regardless, what is unexcusable is that no one was actually out there watching these 62 children yeah. as they fucking played. Oh my God. Aerial school teachers later admitted that the children had been left completely unsupervised that morning during their recess. Any screams of fear or shock that came from the playground was just brushed off as children planks. You know, kids oh scream and stuff. Oh my God. Yeah, right? This is a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, I got caught neglecting children because um, aliens came down. Yeah. And um, that's that's how I got caught. So, cut back to that group of students who didn't run back to the school, right? The older kids. Right. So they're kind of standing there almost in a daze. They're gazing at these things that are just gazing right back at them. Right. Well, it, in the documentary, it was they were saying that they in the, and once again, this has come up with other alien encounters right. before where they feel like they're kind of locked in yes. and not necessarily in a malicious or frightening way. Right. But just in a way where they don't even really try to look to away. break concentration. You know, it's yeah. not even like a thought to do. Right. It's not like they're trying to to, to stop the communication and they exactly. can't. It's just they're fully just like in this connection exactly so many of these students claim that these beings were communicating with them telepathically one student who went by the name elsa in these interviews she claimed that she felt horrible for the entire day after this experience like like physically like she felt sick i don't even know if it was like sick but she said she was unable to shake these images that were Mm. being somehow like implanted in her mind i see and as we know for some it was warnings about environment our effect on the environment and Mm -hmm. for others it was warnings about technology elsa was quoted saying the world is going to end maybe because we don't look after our planet or the air like all the trees will go down and there will be no air people will be dying Wow, dark. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Right? But it mean it seems like yeah, they're showing like these warnings like hey, exactly. It, this is what you got to do. Like you got to get your shit together. And once again, it's a, kind of a lot of uh, you know pressure to be putting on these uh, school children. But, um, right, exactly. You know, I don't know why they're getting the message. I'll do that to some fucking politicians. Or yeah, something. I don't why, know leave why. Leave the fucking kids alone. Right. It's like, I mean, I guess, you know, teach them young. The but. children, they describe these creatures in their eyes as horrifying, but for some reason they just couldn't look away. Hmm. It was like part of the message they were receiving. Yeah. And as we know, like we said, this happens a lot in UFO stories. This Sometimes people feel like they are given messages of foreboding or pleas to change their ways, things yeah. like that. Then the things boarded their craft, and in a flash of incredible speed and power, they were gone. Wow. Now, the reason we actually know about this story today is thanks largely to a journalist named Cynthia Hind. She's often considered Africa's leading UFO researcher. Oh, the, cool. The very next day, she was on the scene interviewing witnesses. She contacted the aerial school headmaster, Mr. Colin Mackey, and asked him to have the children draw pictures of what they had seen. Wow. So when she arrived on the scene, she had a total of 35 drawings waiting for her. All of them had like depictions of the craft and the beings. Yeah, these fo- these drawings are it's, yeah. it's crazy how they all look so similar. Hind investigated the story alongside her son, who was a reporter for the BBC, and an electrical expert named Gunter Hoffer, who scanned the area with a Geiger counter, but found no trace of radiation. Okay. Which Geiger counter, they busted those out a lot at Skinwalker Ranch. Right, right. It's often believed that spacecraft will leave a, a, a radiation signature when right. they've, in places they've recently been. Hmm. So Mackie, the headmaster, was personally skeptical that the children really saw an UFO and these alien beings, but he did say that no matter what, he believed these children. He believed they were telling the truth, even if they were confused. Okay, yeah, yes. So he's like, they definitely saw something, something, they experienced something. But then it's like, I understand being skeptical, of course. Right, of course. But it's like, so if it wasn't aliens or something, like then then what was it? Like, what confused them? Absolutely. Like, that's scarier to me. Yeah, then what was happening? Like, were these, these, like, human beings just, just, like, trying, you know, doing this elaborate thing to scare kids? It's like, what is going on? Right. Hein would also point out that these, most of these children had little or no access to TV or popular publications, so it was unlikely this was just something they had told from pop culture. Right. But by now, the story was starting to make headlines abroad, and it caught the attention of one Dr. John Mack. Okay. He was a professor at Harvard Medical School 
and a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer. He was an American psychiatrist who specialized in alleged abductions, a, uh, alien abductions. Okay. Mac and an, and an associate of his spent two days there interviewing 12 children, their parents, and the faculty. He quickly established a rapport with these witnesses, and it was clear the children had been traumatized, not wow. only by the event, but also by the public ridicule of course. that oh came after. Of course. Oh, God. According to Mac, all the children gave accounts that matched up and were reliable. So right away, he knew there was this wasn't a case of mass hysteria, mm-hmm. which is something that'll get its own episode because there's very interesting stuff about mass right. hysteria. It, it, Mac was quoted saying, The children experienced a very powerful encounter with these beings and were left with a rather disturbing fact that this seems to be what it is and it seems to have no other psychiatric explanation. I would never say yes, there are aliens taking people, but... I would say there is compelling, powerful phenomenon here that I can't account for in any other way. Yet, I can't know what it is, but it seems to me that it invites a deeper, further inquiry. I mean, it, so yeah, the, some it's just, it's yeah. so obvious. It's right. just, this clearly happened. Absolutely. Now, as you might expect, when the witnesses are 62 children with no adult present, this case often gets dismissed as just child fantasy. Mm-hmm. Cynthia Hine would have this to say for disbelieving parents. What a frightening indictment of our society, that when we are confronted by something we don't understand, we don't even attempt to open our minds to the event. I mean, that's like a thesis statement for this gosh darn podcast. Absolutely. I mean, it's so true. It's like, why are we just writing stuff off when it's like, oh yeah, this is a very, clearly a weird event. We don't know what it is. It's absolutely. like, we should absolutely be trying to figure out what happened because this is crazy. Absolutely. I'm so excited for this documentary that's going to come out that's yeah. more solely focused on this. But the doc, what was the documentary called that we watched? Well, the one we watched was called The Phenomenon. But right. I don't know what the one's called that's going to be focused directly right. on that story. But The Phenomenon is it's, it's yeah, really so, good. Uh, yeah, I really hope you guys watch the documentary The Phenomenon because it is just so interesting to see all these kids thinking the same thing and it's like it's so easy to think oh yeah a bunch of kids together that's unreliable when it's like I think that's probably one of the most reliable demographics. Now it should be stated that in the years since it happened none of the 62 witnesses have changed their story. Right. It should be noted that while this incident happened on September 6th just two days before on the 14th There were many eyewitnesses' accounts across southern Africa of a sort of meteor-like object zipping through the sky. Hello. And on top of that, just 25 miles from Rua, where Ariel School is located, there is another school called the Pier House School. And there, a hundred children claim to have watched a UFO hover and act as though it was searching for a place to land. At this very same time, 25 miles away in Rua, The radios on all the school buses in the district malfunctioned, producing nothing but static. I mean, scary, but cool, but and fun. I mean, it's everything all all wrapped up together. But I mean, wow, clearly something major was going on. It's years later and the witnesses of the aerial school event are still ridiculed for what happened to them. That's so fucking stupid. One former student who was interviewed in my source from the Mail and Guardian says... 62 kids between the ages of 6 and 12 saw the aliens land and get out of their little ships. When the kids returned to class, they were completely freaked out and couldn't stop nattering about little men who looked a bit like Michael Jackson. The teachers told them to shut up, as teachers are wont to do, and classes proceeded. But the next day, school received a bunch of calls from parents wanting to know why their kids were spooked. It got so that the teachers started to freak out too, and a UFO expert called Cynthia Hind was invited to speak to everyone. It was via her, I think, that we heard about a famous shrink who was coming to the U.S. to assess the children. What was his name now? Uh, Mac. Dr. John Mac, who I heard was killed by a drunk driver a few years back. In my sources, there was a link to another story, and I wanted to briefly just talk about it here at the end, because the humanoids in this story are strangely similar to the ones of the Zimbabwe story. Oh, okay, let's, okay, here we go. This sighting happened on February 2nd, 1971, at about 8 p.m. This happened in Finland. Oh, okay. a rural road in Finland. Two women were driving when a bright light appeared behind them and began to follow the car. They stopped the car, and so did this craft. And then suddenly, from it came a humanoid approximately three feet tall, wearing a greenish-brown suit. It crossed the road with a series of little jumps. 
on the face, where the face would be, there was a plate almost like a, um, they said it resembled a sort of deep sea diver scuba outfit. <gasps> like those sort of, ta- like it had a little window or something on the front. Oh oh my gosh, yeah, because it's, I mean, I'm only assuming this must, yeah. in a di- he's in a different dang atmosphere. He needs some kind of, you know, gear. And this, they said apparently they had little arms and legs, but nothing to indicate that there were fingers and toes. And just a few days later on the 5th, Two Finnish lumberjacks. Oh, okay. A 21-year-old woman and an 18-year-old woman also spotted something similar in the woods on their way back home from working. I'm, first of all, just excited that these are two lady lumberjacks. Two lady lumberjacks. Very cool. But going on, but so, but that sorry, was no, I got distracted. That's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. But this, so these are similar looking creatures, but just in a different part of the wow. world. Wow. Weird, but I gotta say, very. Um, I'm getting kind of a cuter vibe that it jumps across cuter. the road and it has a little mask. Absolutely. <gasps> Wow. Absolutely. Okay. So the fin. So we got the Finnish version, and then we got the the Zimbabwe version. So wow. Okay. Crazy. I really am looking forward to this documentary. Me too. And I would love to hear what you guys think about the Zimbabwe encounter. That's right, citizens of the Milky Way. That's gonna wrap it up for today's episode, the Zimbabwe encounter. Thank you so much for joining us for our first episode of 2021. We hope you have a happy, happy New Year. Yes. And just a lovely day. As Absolutely. Well. We thank you all for your support. If you want to support the show, go to patreon.com backslash creepstreetpodcast. My name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Citizens of the Milky Way, good night and goodbye.